thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Um, we don't usually come to Finland to warm up, but we've had a strange spring in southern Ontario, so it's been minus two for the last three weeks. We have no snow, but it's been cold, so we're actually coming to Helsinki because it's warmer, better weather here. I'm not sure you usually get that kind of compliment, but that, that's the, uh, the, the case. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm a, a professor at the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. I've been involved uh, with InterI since uh, 1996. I chair the Mental Health Network for InterI. That group is uh, meeting in Turku uh, starting tomorrow for three days. Uh, you'll see we have uh, collaborators from about 23 different countries uh, now. So some of our international guests that are joining us today are, are part of that network and we're delighted that um, uh, Yerke is hosting us. He's now formally been appointed as an Associate Fellow of InterEye, so we look forward to collaborating with him uh, in, in his work in, in Finland uh, as well. Um, most of my research initially started uh, in the area of aging, looking at uh, home care and long-term care were of particular interest uh, to me. But um, in 1996, Ontario mandated the Rye 2.0 for use in complex continuing care hospitals. Um, and it was being implemented for clinical reasons, but also for funding reasons. The Associate Deputy Minister of Health at the time invited Brand Fries, who's speaking this afternoon, and me, who was a junior professor, uh, an assistant professor at the time, to come meet with her to talk about what to do about mental health. And she said, well, can you inter -I people create an instrument for mental health with a case mix system like you have for nursing homes and post-acute care? And Brand Fries, being the full professor, said, yes, we can, and Hurdies will lead it. So that, that's how I became uh, involved in the mental health work um, in inter -I. I then made a major switch in my focus to uh, get a lot more substantive and methodological training in mental health research and have been involved in it ever since. Um, my newest role um, uh, related to mental health is I've just been appointed by the president of my university to chair a university-wide committee on student mental health in university settings. And so it's a new area of work uh, for me and, and will be on the agenda for the inter -I group uh, as well because it's a, a sort of a new population that does receive mental health services uh, in the Canadian context, not through the typical mental health system. Universities do provide counseling and health services but I'm learning very quickly it's not very well organized and there's not a lot of evidence uh, around that, so it's a new opportunity for us. Um, what I'll be doing today is to try to give you a little bit of a taste of different pieces of, of how inter -I systems uh, could be used um, in, in mental health work, both from a research point of view but from a clinical and management perspective as well. So I'll show you a little bit about cross-national comparisons that might be uh, possible. I want to spend a good deal of time talking about the value of an integrated mental health uh, system and why we need to take a systems approach to um, a mental health concerns. A bit of research around risk assessment methodologies. And then I'd like to step through a sequence of, of points of discussion about how inter work relates to uh, recovery from uh, mental illness in terms of rates of improvement, looking at quality, thinking about clinical applications related to recovery and some subjective uh, perspectives on that. So let's start to think about opportunities for cross-national um, uh, collaboration. So this is a, a representation of the inter -I network. Um, you can see we, we have all the continents of the world covered except for Antarctica. There's no penguin research in, uh, involved in inter -I's, uh, agenda. Uh, but we have lots of active collaborators around the world. The countries with the blue text are ones where there is a formal fellow appointed to inter -I from those countries. In green text, we're collaborating with people in those countries, but well, we don't yet have a formal fellow uh, appointed. But if I uh, lighten uh, some of the countries, the, the countries that are left with darker text are the ones where there's mental health research happening or large-scale implementation underway. So our sub-network around mental health has over 20 countries uh, involved. And although it's a newer part of inter -I, we're starting to see uh, considerable opportunities to start to do cross-national comparative research. So I thought I'd show you some examples from some work 
of pilot studies in community mental health in Canada, the United States, and Finland. So we have three samples to work with in the data that I have available to me. Um, a Canadian sample of about 1,000 cases in general community mental health services, a Finnish sample of around 1,500 uh, that were gathered a few years ago here in, in Finland, and from New York State, a recent uh, sample of about 2,800 uh, cases of community mental health clients gathered there. When we started to collaborate with colleagues in, in Finland, the, a, a comment was made, well, we think Finnish community mental health is very different from what you see in, in North America. And so it's interesting to sort of ask the question, well, how different is, is Finland? If we look at the age distributions, first of all, uh, I think the answer is not really that different. Most are in the 18 to 44 or 45 to 64 population. In the Canadian sample, we have a little bit higher proportion that are over 65 because in Ontario, community mental health agencies do consultation services to nursing homes where somebody has a behavioral issue. The community mental health agency may come in and do a consultation. So that's why we have a little bit more in, in that sample. Um, the sex distribution is pretty much the same across the samples that we have from the three different countries. You'll also notice that the large majority of people in these community mental health agencies are not married in all three countries. Uh, these are, are generally individuals who, who are single. The, per, the percentages differ a bit, but not radically. Um, uh, it, it really is uh, the same story across uh, the, the three different settings. There are some differences in, in housing. So the Canadian and U.S. samples um, are predominantly folks in private uh, homes, around 70%. This could be a rented room or an apartment or uh, an owned home. But the finished sample is almost a 50-50 split between private accommodation and some other uh, service settings. So a little bit of a difference there. Uh, but let's take a look at mood disorder diagnosis. Uh, so if we look at the the uh, uh, community mental health assessment and look is is there a mood disorder diagnosis present you see the highest proportion were in Canada at around 55 percent uh, in the the US it was reasonably comparable a bit lower rate and a little bit lower again in Finland if we look at depressive symptoms based on a scale that we have embedded in the community mental health instrument the Canadian and US pattern mirrors the diagnostic pattern so there's fewer depressive symptoms in the U.S. sample than in, in the Canadian sample, which is consistent with the slightly lower uh, diagnostic uh, rate of diagnosis in the U.S. sample. But look what happens with Finland. Quite a different result there. So we have the lowest rates of diagnosed mood disorders present, but much more severe depressive symptoms present. Um, which e you know, either says there's something not valid about how depression is measured in Finns or there's underdiagnosis happening. Now, uh, I don't have a validity test, but I can show you reliability results in the three countries based on the Chromebox Alpha. A point eight is excellent reliability. In all three countries, the reliability is excellent. So it's not a reliability issue. It may still be a validity issue in Finland, where it's not so much in other countries. My guess is it's more under detection and under diagnosis uh, than anything. Then we could take a look at a schizophrenia diagnosis uh, as another um, uh, example. And here we see the Canadian and Finnish samples look quite comparable uh, to each other with about half the, uh, the population in the sample having a schizophrenia diagnosis. In the US, the rates are a little bit lower. If we look at the positive symptom scale, which we've validated against the PANS previously, you see a result between the Canadian and Finnish um, uh, sample that's pretty consistent. More people with no positive symptoms in the U.S. sample, which is consistent with the lower diagnosis rate, but there are people who do have positive symptoms in both settings. And in this case, the Finnish results are consistent with the Canadian results in the sense that you see about the same rates of positive symptoms and you see a comparable rate of diagnosis. So for this one, I, I'm not so concerned by a mismatch of what we're seeing in symptoms and diagnosis in schizophrenia in the Finnish population. In this case, the reliabilities are a little bit lower, still above acceptable thresholds, and all of them reasonable reliabilities in all three uh, countries. The, the last uh, comparison to take a look at is now moving away from diagnosis and looking at some aspects of the person's uh, social life. So we can take a look at the person's personal finances and we have a care planning protocol related to that. One is around their ability to manage their finances, which is the um, 
lower part of the bar. The other is whether they're experiencing economic hardship, uh, which is the darker brown part of the bar. What's interesting for this is that issues with managing, um, with dealing with economic hardship is pretty consistent in all three mental health populations. That if, if we look at the Finnish population, somewhere um, in the range of 25% having economic hardship, pretty comparable to the US, slightly lower than we see in the Canadian sample. But managing the finances, um, uh, irrespective of, uh, of the poverty levels, uh, has the lowest rate of this issue in the US and the highest rate in, in the Finnish population. We can also take a look at um, indications of social withdrawal. So our social withdrawal scale, we have validated against the PANS as, as well um, with that. And what's interesting is that, again, the rates of having no signs of social withdrawal are highest in, in the U.S., but the rates of, of high social withdrawal are highest in Finland. Now, you know, I've noticed that Finnish audiences aren't the most gregarious audiences in the world, so maybe, you know, being a little bit socially withdrawn is, is okay. Uh, but, it's, but it's interesting to see the, this difference. These are Finns assessed by Finns, Canadians assessed by Canadians. So is this a cultural difference or is it a, a true difference in what's happening in, in, in the, the lives of these individuals? And for this scale, the reliabilities were very high again for that, that social withdrawal scale. So it's just a little taste of the kinds of things we can start to do when we have the same measures available in different countries. We can do psychometric testing to see are the scales reliable. We can look at substantive issues of what are the experiences of people in different countries. And we can look at clinical practice to see are we picking up symptoms uh, as much as we might in different settings. So let's switch now to talk about the issue of the integrated mental health um, uh, assessment system. So we think of the inter eye mental health instruments as a, an integrated as a mental health information system uh, because what we have is a series of compatible assessment systems that go from newborns to centenarians. So Shannon Stewart this afternoon will talk about our assessments for newborns to three-year-olds and four to 17-year-olds. So the child and youth mental health instruments cover the child and uh, early uh, and adolescent uh, population. There's an adolescent supplement that goes with it, a youth justice supplement, and a quality of life survey for uh, children and, and youth. For the adult population, we have a large range of instruments for persons with intellectual disabilities, the community and inpatient mental health instruments, a, a, a correctional facility assessment for prison sit settings, and then we have our nursing home and home care instruments, which are quite well known and widely used around the world, but they also contain a substantial amount of mental health information, so you can really understand mental health right from the earliest parts of, of, of life and into later life. And we have screening tools, including a brief mental health screener, an emergency screener for psychiatry that feeds into the community mental health instrument, and a contact assessment for the home uh, and community care instruments. All these are designed to work with each other to measure things in, in a consistent way. So what makes them uh, an integrated system? First of all, they have a common language, uh, use of consistent terminology across different settings. If we measure pain, we measure it in the same way in all instruments. If we measure cognition or delusions or depressive symptoms, it's done the same way across the instruments. All of these instruments have a common design in that they've, they have data elements that trigger care planning. A flag goes up uh, when certain items are present in order to trigger a care plan. That's how we structure our instruments. Uh, they all have a common emphasis on function rather than diagnosis alone. They track diagnosis, as you saw, but it's not only about diagnosis, and they're not instruments created to drive diagnosis. They use the same professional uh, interviewing skills and clinical judgment using all sources of information. So if you train somebody on how to use one inter eye instrument, training them on how to use another one is actually pretty straightforward. You, they just need to learn about some of the new substantive items, but the methodology for how you do assessment is consistent. There's common core data elements that appear across instruments, and there's common care planning protocols for adjacent sectors of the health system. So community mental health and inpatient psychiatry and emergency psychiatry share a common set of care planning protocols where they can work collaboratively in a coordinated approach uh, to care uh, focusing on the same issues.
so this is just an example comparing our inpatient instrument and the community instrument. They share about 110 items that are core items across that full suite of assessment systems, and they have 220 other shared items between the inpatient and community instrument. But the inpatient instrument has 66 items that are not in the community instrument, and the community instrument has 75 items that are not in the inpatient instrument. So lots of overlap, but still some distinctive components for issues you wouldn't necessarily assess in, in one setting or the other. This just gives you a representation of what's happening in Canada. Every one of these icons it represents a large-scale implementation or mandated use of our instruments uh, across the country. Uh, so we are now at a point, um, finally, where in every part of the country, instruments are at least being pilot tested, but in all but one province, there are instruments mandated or about to be mandated. Only Quebec has not yet uh, mandated any instruments. It's culturally very different, um, uh, so that'll uh, take some time. But you can see the inter-I suite is used in a large-scale basis um, across Canada. This is Ontario. I live right about there. And my province has been probably the one that's been most um, forward-thinking in terms of implementation of, of these instruments on a large-scale basis. So uh, to give you a context, the Canadian population is about 33 million people, and so far, just counting the nursing home, home care, and inpatient mental health instruments, we have s individual assessments on 3.3 million different Canadians. There's about 9.6 million assessments being done already. So in Canada, outside of Quebec, virtually everybody in the country knows at least one person who's been assessed by an, an intra instrument. I, when I work through my friends and families, I know 15 different individuals who've been assessed by the mental health instrument, the home care instrument, the nursing home instrument, the palliative care uh, instrument, or, or some other combination of them. With all those implementations, when data are gathered in these um, different provinces, the data go to the Canadian Institute for Health Information nationally, which acts as a national reporting uh, body um, for our inter-I data. And then those data are de-identified and made available for us uh, inter-I fellows to use for research purposes. So we have a lot of assessments in these different settings, but we can also start to understand unique populations. So there's about 10,000 Canadians who were in home care, then went to nursing home settings, and then later on ended up in inpatient psychiatry. That's a pretty rare population. You don't see a lot of those people if you were to do a study on your own as a researcher, but we capture everybody in the, in the, the country or the province that would have those attributes so we can start to do longitudinal transition-oriented research that becomes really interesting to take a look at. <laughs> So let me show you one example of why having an integrated system is useful to understand population. So this slide, the next slide I'm going to show you, has 1.78 million distinct Canadians. So an adequate sample size for most inferences. That, that was a joke. Um, but um, so you know, 1.78 million is a, a pretty good um, uh, population to look at. So this just looks at our cognitive performance scale, which goes from zero for cognitively intact to six for very severely impaired. So we have people in inpatient psychiatry, palliative care, community mental health services, community support service agencies, older adults in psychiatry, home care clients, post-acute hospital settings, geriatric psychiatry patients in geriatric psychiatry units, and nursing home um, uh, settings. What's interesting is that if you look at the people who tend to live in communities, tend to be more cognitively uh, intact. If you look at um, uh, some other populations like home care and geriatric psychiatry, they're kind of a middle population where there's more cognitive impairment appearing. And then if you look at institutional settings like post-acute hospitals, geriatric psychiatry units in, in, in hospitals and nursing homes, there's a more severely impaired population. So as you go from community to institution, you go from less cognitive impairment to more cognitive impairment. But there's some unusual samples here. There are these people who live in community settings who are very severely cognitively impaired. So for example, these people getting community support services with a CPS of five, that's a um, mini mental state of around, what, eight uh, or less, and they're living in the community. You wonder, well, how long are they able to stay in the community? Are they heading for a nursing home uh, setting? And then there's these people that are in post-acute hospital settings, 
geriatric psychiatry units and nursing homes, why are they there? They're cognitively intact. They shouldn't be there. They should be in some kind, type of a community setting receiving community supports. So because we have a common way of measuring things, we can understand what the entire population looks like across many sectors of the health system and think about redesigning processes to get the right people in those different uh, clinical service settings. So now let's talk about risk screening in, in crisis situations, some examples of, of clinical applications for how we can use these instruments. So there's two tools that I'd like to talk about. The emergency screener for psychiatry is, is one. We designed this to be compatible with the inpatient and community instruments. Instead of using a three-day look-back period to say what were you like today, yesterday, and the day before, the focus is on what were you like today, because the idea is to, is to get very quick information, not to have to wait for three days of observation to understand what the person uh, is experiencing. And we also include a response set that it says the person has the symptoms right now. Um, I guess, you know, you're completing the assessment and the person's about to punch you in the nose. You have to duck, say, doing it now, and then move on to the rest of the assessment. It's not quite that, that, um, uh, that bad. But the emphasis here in these uh, and the emergency screener is on risk appraisal and patient safety issues. And we focus on the main, three main reasons for involuntary admissions of inability to care for self, harm to others, and, and harm to self as the three uh, main uh, risk areas of interest. But you could use these data for other purposes like placement, um, management of beds, uh, and, and so on. The other instrument that we have is the brief mental health screener, um, which is designed to be compatible with the emergency screener, the mental health instrument, and the community instrument. It also uses a 24-hour period, but the idea here is this is used by non-mental health professionals like police officers, and in Ontario, it's starting to be implemented on a large-scale basis for police officers to use during mental health apprehensions in, in the community. Part of the reason that they like it is it gives them a standardized terminology that they can use. It's terminology consistent with what the inpatient um, um, settings use. And we look at the implementation of the brief mental health screener with police as a mental health educational intervention to improve police understanding of, of mental health concerns. So you'll hear a little bit more from Brand Fries uh, this afternoon. Um, there's a large scale uh, implementation happening with our provincial police as well as specific uh, city police. And so this uh, chief p uh, of police in the Brantford region refers to th that implementation as having been a game changer. It's, it's very substantially changed how police are dealing with persons with mental illness. And this is an actual police cruiser in Ontario with the inter-eye brief mental health screener right on the dashboard, how police officers complete that at the time of an apprehension and they send it into hospitals if they're going to bring the person to hospital so the hospital know who's coming. And so if we think about a, a basic business process of interaction between police and emergency psychiatry staff, what happens in the community is the police officer may apprehend somebody with mental health concerns and the police officer will speak to the person, to family members, neighbors, other witnesses in making his or her report but they now use that information to inform their decisions about the brief mental health screener. The brief mental, when the person comes to an emergency setting, the nurse would do his or her own assessment, again, speaking with the person, family members, uh, looking at the chart, uh, speaking to other staff, but would also have information from the police officer. Now the police officer can communicate information in a consistent language with the inpatient psychiatry settings or the emergency psychiatry settings so that the, the quality of the police report is now much better is one of the things that, that's happened with this. Um, so I mentioned that um, we uh, use um, the emergency screener for estimating risk of harm to self and others and inability to care for self. Um, and um, we also, for the brief mental health screener, have subscales that, that, that perform those same uh, basic uh, functions. In Canada, we have an agency called Accreditation Canada. They provide accreditation reviews or quality reviews of organizations. They'll come to your organization with a team of of uh, health experts and will review all the business processes in, in your healthcare setting, speak to staff, speak to patients, speak to family members, and they'll provide an accreditation of whether your organization is 
good or not so good, often you know, what you get is an accreditation that allows for four years where they'll say you've provided uh, good quality of care. What Accredita Accreditation Canada does is they often write documents called required organizational practices. So in order to get accreditation, you must have these practices fulfilled as a standard of care. So they've done one around suicide where they say that if you're going to get accreditation from our organization, you have to have a mechanism to identify people at risk of suicide. You have to have a reassessment uh, process uh, done on a regular basis. You have to address the immediate safety needs related to suicide-related behavior, and you need some type of a treatment and monitoring protocol uh, to deal with those issues. So the question is, well, how can InterI help with this? Actually, quite well. So we have a direct measure of suicide risk um, in the emergency screening for psychiatry, the community mental health instrument, the inpatient instrument, and the child and youth mental health instrument. We ask these questions uh, directly. There's less direct measures, but still useful measures in the nursing home, home care, and community health assessments. So if you're using an intra-eye assessment in mental health settings, you've already f uh, fulfilled the first two bullets of identifying risk and monitoring on a regular basis. Our care planning protocols, which are the orange manuals on the right, include guidelines for how to manage purposeful self-harm. So remember the, the third um, uh, and fourth bullets here is that you need to address those immediate safety concerns and have treatment and monitoring strategies in place. Those orange manuals tell you what to do in terms of ways to think about managing self-harm risk for children and youth or adults in those various settings. So we have an algorithm that takes into account self-injury related ideation, having a history of suicide attempts, having family members being concerned about self-injury, the depressive severity index, which I showed you earlier, uh, the positive symptom scale and the cognitive uh, performance scale, all of those you've, you've seen a little bit about already. So if somebody is currently thinking about hurting him or herself, they've had a previous suicide attempt and they score very high on depressive symptoms, they're in the highest risk group. So they're thinking about hurting themselves, they've tried to end their life previously, and now they're very severely depressed, I think you need to worry about that person. But if somebody has not thought about hurting themselves in a very long time or never, has had no previous attempt, is not showing a lot of positive symptoms, um, and no family members are worried, and they're cognitively intact, that's your lowest risk group and all the other groups are sort of in between based on different combinations of those clinical characteristics. So if you look at self-harm in community mental health, emergency um, psychiatry, inpatient acute psychiatry, forensics, geriatric psychiatry, and long-stay units, you'll see different triggering rates for this care planning protocol. We put people into a high and moderate risk based on scores on that scale. So we see the lowest risks are in community mental health at around um, um, 12 or 13 percent, and a small proportion are in the high risk category. And the highest risk are in inpatient settings. Initially, I worried that that was a mistake, that it was higher in inpatient than emergency, but of course, not everybody who comes to an emergency setting is at highest risk. The people at highest risk will be more likely to be admitted, so it makes sense actually that the most severe rates are in the inpatient settings. But notice it's also pretty high in these long stay uh, psychiatry uh, units as well. If we look at the algorithm for harm to others, which is used as a different decision tree, there the highest triggering rate is in forensic psychiatry, not surprisingly, uh, but it's also second highest in geriatric psychiatry, which people may not have thought of, but people who get admitted to geriatric psychiatry units in Ontario are generally people with very high behavior disturbance in nursing homes that the nursing homes can't manage and they send them to psychiatry. The self-care algorithm deals mainly with um, um, cognition, positive symptoms, and mania indicators um, uh, that may result in, in problems with self-care. And for self-care, not surprisingly, it's highest uh, triggering in the geriatric psychiatry population. Overall, this risk um, uh, algorithm triggers at higher rates than the other algorithms, but a lot of people were surprised that it also triggers at a fairly high rate in forensic psychiatry. The reason for that is forensic psychiatry has a lot of very long stay people that are now aging in place in uh, forensic uh, settings. So what about uh, Finland? Well, going back to that community mental health sample that we talked about earlier, what you can see is the triggering rates in community mental health are 
pretty comparable between the Canadian and Finnish samples at around 15 to, uh, percent, a little bit lower in the U.S. community mental health sample. The harm to others risk algorithm actually triggers at a higher rate in Finland, mainly due to the higher moderate risk category. It's lowest in the U.S. Uh, again. And for self-care, again, triggers at the highest rate in the Finnish community mental health sample, again, mainly because of that moderate risk uh, category. Notice in the U.S. sample, there's very few people in the very highest risk um, uh, categories in the community mental health sample that, that uh, we have from, from that uh, country. So pretty comparable between Canada and Finland for, for the most part in terms of that, that risk algorithm. But how do we know that the self-harm scale um, uh, actually works. Well, we derive the severity of self-harm scale using clinician um, judgment uh, initially. What we did is we had people do the emergency screener for psychiatry, and at the end of it say, said, based on your clinical appraisal of this person, would you say that this person has minimal risk, mild risk, moderate, very severe, to imminent risk of harming him or herself, and we gave keywords to describe what we meant by that. We didn't just give those descriptors, we actually gave descriptions of what imminent risk uh, means. And what you can see in the derivation sample, the higher that risk score, the smaller the proportion of, popula of people rated as being minimal risk, and the higher the proportion of population being rated as severe, very severe, or imminent risk. So it, it hung together nicely in the, the derivation sample, but these were the data we used to create the algorithm. So it's kind of self-evident that that would be uh, the case. But if we take a look at um, why people were admitted in an independent uh, sample, now using about 200,000 observations, if we look at um, uh, uh, teenagers, uh, younger to middle-aged adults, middle-aged to older adults, and, and the elderly, we can look at the, the relationship between the scale and that you were admitted because of self-harm. And in each case, for every single point increment on the scale, there was a huge increase in the odds of being admitted due to self-harm. So a 1.99 meant that for every increment on that scale, the odds of being admitted because of self-harm doubled. But if you look at a six-point difference on that scale, you had 64 times greater odds. So it's an it's a, um, exponential increase in risk based on, on that odds ratio. The other thing you want to look at is the C st statistic, and the C statistic is like a coin toss. It tells you the number of times you get heads when you flip a coin. If a coin is unbalanced, you get heads 50% of the time. What this is saying is with this algorithm, you get heads 80% of the time. So it's a very strong indication of predictive validity for the reason for admission now in an independent sample. We can also take a look at whether they actually tried to harm themselves during an inpatient stay. So in this case, what we did is we separated the admission and the discharge assessment so we were certain there was no overlap in the observation period. And we looked at, based on the initial assessment, did the person harm him or herself at the follow-up uh, assessment. And what you can see is for the not triggered group, uh, we, uh, we only had about 1% uh, try to harm themselves, or actually harm themselves as an inpatient, but the rates go up to 7% and 9% uh, for the moderate and high risk categories. The, and the odds ratio for the high risk category is 13 times increase in the odds of actually harming yourself while an inpatient. And again, the C statistic is very strong at about 0.78. The last thing that we did, uh, we had to wait 10 years to get enough data, but we looked at actual inpatient suicides. So death by suicide while under the care of a psychiatric hospital. It's a rare event. We needed a million assessments to capture 90 deaths um, by suicide in, in hospitals. When you have an event that this is this rare, now our, we're in rate, the rate per thousand, you can't use the C statistic. But what you can see is there's a strong increase in the odds of death by suicide in an inpatient setting based on, on that uh, scale. So what do we know about that scale? It is consistent with a clinician's opinion, it's consistent with why people are admitted, and it's consistent with self-harm attempts in inpatient psychiatry, and it predicts actual deaths by suicide in inpatient settings. So I, I think that's about as much evidence as you're going to get for validity in any scale that, that you're uh, taking a look at. And so the other part of this is the care planning protocols that we 
created were done through a collaborative effort of the Interim Mental Health Network with researchers from 15 different countries looking at all the international best practice protocols on what do we do about self-harm related behavior. So by using these INTRI tools, you can fully uh, meet those requirements of, of accreditation Canada. This is a different paper that we did on predictive validity of inpatient violence attempts using our risk of harm to others uh, scale. This was done in a um, especially psychiatric hospital where we looked at inpatient incidents and you can see based on that survival curve the higher the risk category for that care planning protocol um, the, the higher the incidence of inpatient violent, uh, violence episodes. So now let's switch over to thinking about how intra instruments support concepts related to recovery um, from mental illness. And if we think about questions we might be interested in with respect to recovery, one of the things you want to know as a basic question is, do people that go to inpatient settings get better? Because if you're not getting better in terms of psychiatric symptoms, that is kind of a, a, a rate limiter for your likelihood of, of recovering. So I'm going to show you um, a schematic here of what the following slides would look like if nothing happened. What I've done is I've color-coded the um, uh, scores on, in this case, hopelessness uh, at admission to discharge. So you're going to see the hopelessness scores at admission of being not present, being present but not exhibited in a three-day period, being exhibited one to two days, and daily in the last uh, three days. If nothing happened, if people who were who had a daily, continued to have a daily, um, didn't change, this, this bar would be all red. If people who didn't have it before still don't have it, this bar would be all green. So this is the complete ineffectiveness graph. You know, nothing changes based on the admission and discharge ratings. So this is what we actually see. So these are the scores at admission, and the colors represent their discharge scores. And what you see is for every category of hopelessness at admission, by the time of discharge, the large majority of people no longer have those symptoms present. So in the people who had it daily at admission, about 70% no longer had it at all by discharge. There's more people who still had it daily than, than elsewhere, but it's a radical improvement in, in, in those psychiatric symptoms. And you don't see a lot of people who didn't have it at admission uh, that uh, developed it uh, by the time of discharge. Now take a look at hallucinations and delusions. You see still uh, the majority of people go from having the symptoms to not having them um, at discharge, but it's not quite as good as the hopelessness change. The hallucinations uh, are a bit harder to get rid of. It's a, it's a bit more complicated uh, symptom, and so you have more people that continue to have it on a daily basis uh, at discharge. And this one looks at persistent anger. And, and again, a little bit poor performance uh, there, persistent anger kind of persistent um, um, by definition, but still the majority of people have gotten better to the point that they're not having those symptoms at the time of, of discharge. You can also take a look at something like the Depressive Severity Index to look at the distribution of the score on the scale at admission. You see there's only about 25% of people who had none of those symptoms, and it's really widely spread over all the categories. But by the time you look at the discharge assessment, you now have 55% of people in the zero um, symptoms uh, category, and there's a huge change in the mean score from admission to discharge. So the, the good news is that, at least in Ontario hospitals, people that get admitted to inpatient psychiatry, most of their symptoms improve by the time they're discharged not going to win anybody a Nobel Prize, but it's consistent with what you would hope would happen in inpatient psychiatry. But then a question comes up is how well do hospitals do? Does everybody have the same rate of improvement in symptoms uh, over time? We um, several years ago published a paper on risk-adjusted mental health quality indicators. Most of our indicators are outcome-based. If you look at the quality literature in psychiatry, there's lots of people who will have structural measures, you know, the number of patients per psychiatrist, or will have process measures, like you should be assessed by somebody with a comprehensive mental health assessment tool, but there's very few studies that have outcome-based quality indicators, because generally the data aren't available uh, to do that. We're able to look at outcomes in multiple different uh, domain areas, and those Outcome indicators can be useful for improving quality through internal efforts, 
for program evaluation purposes, for accreditation visits, or for public uh, reporting. So this is the rate of risk-adjusted improvement in depressive symptoms by hospitals sorted from the lowest rate to the highest rate. So we have one hospital in Ontario where the rate of improvement in depressive symptoms is around 35%. We have another hospital where the rate of improvement is 90%. Now let's say that those are two very weird hospitals that we don't know why that's the case and we should just ignore them. Let's look at the, the third lowest, well that's 42% the third highest is still around 90%. There's massive variation in the rate of improvements between these hospitals. We have put in place risk adjustment methodologies to try to make sure that we're talking about the same patient population, but there's big differences. The median rate is around 76%, but from the first to the third quartile, it's from anywhere from 67% to 83%. So huge practice pattern differences in terms of outcomes of care in these hospitals after we risk adjust for them. Then we could also take a look at performance on all these other domain areas. So if, uh, what we're seeing here is the, the median rate and then the first to third quartile is, is the, um, the whiskers around it. So we've already looked at, at depressive symptoms. Aggressive behavior has the same median rate but now wider patterns of, of improvement for it. Um, same with disruptive behavior, violence, and cognition is, is a, a fairly uh, comparable. So in terms of major psychiatric symptoms, the median rate is around 80%, but there's a considerable degree of variance uh, around that. But then if we look at, sorry, that was positive symptoms, look at cognition, much less improvement. The median rate is now 50% uh, across uh, hospitals. For ADL functioning, it's around 55%. For ability to manage your finances and medications, it's only around 35%. So if we want people to go back to the community and live their lives independently, helping them to get better at managing their, their finances and medications is a pretty important thing to do, and we don't do very well at, at it. Um, pain, we don't do very well either, only about 50% to improve in pain. Th these are the only two process measures, the use of acute control medications and physical restraints, and this looks at interpersonal conflict. It also doesn't improve uh, very well. So a basic finding here is that psychiatric hospitals do pretty good at managing psychiatric symptoms, even though there's variance between hospitals, but they do less well at dealing with the things that let you lead your life the way you want to lead, lead your life in the community. When we did some historical comparisons between the quality indicators in 2005 to 2011, um, this was before we had published the paper on the quality indicators, what we saw is that overall 14 of the 25 quality indicators improved only six got worse and five didn't change. What that means is that even though the system was blinded to quality indicators because we hadn't created them yet, the quality of care, risk adjusted, seemed to improve after about five or six years of implementation of the interim mental health assessment system. I can't necessarily draw the inference that therefore we improved the quality of care, but that's one of a list of potential explanations for what may have happened. So a reasonable next question is, well, how are we supposed to get at helping people recover from mental illness? We know we can measure symptoms, but what tools do we have to support recovery in community and institutional settings? And the basic answer is the care planning protocols that we have attached with, with the instruments. So the research that we did first uh, involved a huge amount of uh, international consultation. The Mental Health Network was founded to do the work to create these protocols. So we worked with our fellows and collaborators in different countries to get information from around the world on how do you manage a, a, a specific uh, mental health issue. Um, that we had international experts work with us to write the care planning protocols, and then we did re extensive reviews through two major committees in InterI, the Mental Health Network and the Instrument and System uh, Development Committee. We did literature reviews to look at best practice guidelines in typically North America, Europe, and Asia, we, um, and Australia and, and New Zealand to see that we could get consistent evidence around that. Where we could, we took a, a look at the non-English literature, but truth be told, we focused mainly on, on the English language literature. And what we found is that best practice guidelines in one country weren't always best practice guidelines in another country. And so we as an international network had to resolve those discrepancies. The simplest way to illustrate that is if you think about the policies for how you manage use of, of 
illegal substances in the state of Florida, British Columbia, Finland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Saudi Arabia. What would be best practice guidelines in all those countries would be very different. In some places you go to jail, some places it's worse than that, and some places can I sell you some more. And so we had to resolve as an international effort, what do we say are the best practice guidelines uh, around this? We found that it wasn't so easy when we were talking about what's a reasonable level of alcohol consumption. The Finns and Canadians tended to agree, but the French weren't very happy with the, the, the narrow-minded, restricted rates of, of wine consumption that we said were acceptable in, in the inter data. But we had to look at what, what the evidence was in terms of, of appropriate use. But the other key thing is we didn't just rely on expert opinions, because experts are very often wrong. And so what we did is we looked at what we got in terms of expert opinion and then tested it with data. So everything in that orange manual is tested with about a third of a million of inpatient assessments, and at the time we only had about 2,000 uh, community mental health instruments. The basic principles for these CAPs were that we had to have evidence that the triggers actually predicted things in future outcomes uh, for the person, and there had to be evidence published in the literature about the, the validity of practice guidelines that we were uh, suggesting. Everything had to be written with an, a recovery lens applied to it, so we're focusing on how we help support the person to recover at different stages from, from mental health concerns. The, the focus was on collaborative decision making between the clinician or the clinical team and the person and wherever appropriate the person's um, uh, support network. We were not creating a robotic library. You don't press a button to have the automatic care plan, it's a way to get at a discussion between the person uh, and the clinical team about their uh, recovery. We focus on all aspects of their, uh, their quality of life uh, as possible using a full in set of interventions including individual interventions, community-based services and family uh, approaches. And in every case, what we're trying to do is find mechanisms to support the person's autonomy as much as possible. So even though the person may have some substantial impairments in cognition or insight, you're trying to find ways to give as much autonomy to that person that's appropriate to where they are in terms of their current state of, of functioning. So we have about 20 care planning protocols. Uh, three, we've already talked around um, patient safety issues. There's a whole bunch that deal with issues around social life, some around economic uh, considerations, threats to autonomy like problems with medication management, rehospitalization, and use of control interventions, and series around uh, physical, several around physical health uh, promotion as well. Once we did all the work to create the care planning protocols, we went through an international review where we sent the protocols out to people um, around the world and asked their, their opinions on three questions. We said, how, how consistent is this care planning protocol with the recovery model as used in your organization? Because we very quickly learned there's no such thing as this, a single recovery model around the world. Different people talk about different things when they're talking about it. But 83% of people said it's completely or mostly consistent with their practice patterns. We said, how consistent is it with your best practice uh, guidelines? 90% said um, uh, that was mostly consistent. How would they rate it? 90% said good or excellent. We used this last round of feedback to do the final um, uh, fine tuning to the care planning protocols. So I want to show you one example of a care planning protocol around traumatic life events. Um, and this is the paper we published around it. So what we did here is to look at several potentially trauma-inducing uh, life events, including things like accidents, death of family members, living in a war zone, and various types of assault and abuse. So these are the objective exposure to that, but a key element is your subjective response to the, that event. So if you were assaulted and you described it as in, inducing an intense sense of fear or horror, that was really important because that subjective response had a huge impact on the likelihood that you would experience trauma-related uh, symptoms. Our focus is on two, treatment, or two trigger levels. One is for immediate uh, uh, safety concerns. So if you've been assaulted or abused in the last week, our focus is entirely on managing that risk, getting you safe. That's what we're dealing with. But if, it's, if you haven't experienced, experienced this in the last week, then our focus becomes on dealing with the trauma-related symptoms, helping you manage those and, and recover from, from those symptoms. So let's take a look at inpatient and community mental health uh, settings. So these are the two trigger levels. 
One, to reduce the long-term impact, and then this is the immediate safety issues. So what you can see is in Canada, the community mental health sample had a much higher rate of triggering this care planning protocol, and in fact, there was higher rates of immediate safety issues. In the community mental health sample that we looked at, uh, is around 15% had immediate safety issues being triggered compared to about 10% in inpatient psychiatry. But if we uh, differentiate that by gender, in community mental health, women were much more likely to trigger the cap and were much more likely to have immediate safety issues. So in Ontario community mental health uh, clients, uh, around 25% of women were experiencing abuse now in the community. Uh, compared to around 15% uh, uh, in inpatient settings, and rates for men were lower. But notice, notice it's also non-trivial. All these populations were e experiencing immediate safety issues. So then look, uh, let's take a look at how that relates to things like conflict with family or friends. So in community settings where the cap was triggered, the rates of conflict with family or friends was much higher. That may be the origin of where the abuse is coming from uh, for the person. Whereas for inpatient settings, the relationship is there, but not as strong. And then look at sleep disturbance. In inpatient settings, there's not much of a relationship, a little bit. But in community settings, the rate of sleep disturbance goes up to over 30% in people that have immediate safety concerns. And it's no wonder, they're in imminent risk of harm. If we were to take a look at um, what happens from admission to discharge, we can take a look at um, whether you say you have a, a confidant or not. At admission, the cap is strongly associated with saying you have no confidant. By discharge, that relationship uh, is weakened. If we take a look at, whoops, yeah. Um, having episodes of panic at admission, there's a strong relationship between the cop being triggered and panic, but that relationship weakens as, as we get closer to discharge as a person is uh, feeling um, uh, more control over their lives. And if you look at negative symptoms of self-deprecation, strong relationship between the cop being triggered at admission, but by the time you get to discharge, that relationship is going down. So those are, that's an example of how you can use the, the care planning protocol to help put in place interventions that can help the person uh, start to recover from their symptoms. And the last example I want to show you is our quali uh, around our quality of life survey, and that gets at, well, what does the person think? If you ask the person directly, what do they say about what they're experiencing, their, their sense of hope for the future, whether staff support their recovery, and, and so on? Our quality of life survey has around 40 items covering all these different domains, uh, your personal outlook, your sense of autonomy. Many of these things, if you're familiar with the recovery literature, are talked about as key dimensions of recovery. We also have some patient experience measures like your relationship with staff members, sense of privacy and access uh, to services uh, as well. So we have uh, samples now from uh, five countries, Canada, Russia, Finland, Hong Kong, and, and Brazil. And we purposely sought out a variety of different populations. We had some inpatient psychiatry units. We had community mental health programs in two countries. And we also had a, general, had a survey of the general population in the Waterloo region where we just randomly called people at home and asked them the uh, questions on, on the survey. So I'm only going to show you three examples of, of items uh, that we've got. So this looks at whether you feel hopeful about your future. In the general population, about 90% of people said, yes, I feel hopeful about my future. So this is in just the, the general community. And you can see it drops down substantially. So by the time you get to the Hong Kong community mental health population, only around 25 to 30% of people said they're hopeful about future most of the time. Finland was around the 60% rate comparable to one of the Canadian inpatient uh, hospital settings. But people in the Russian hospitals were more optimistic than the Finns. Uh, Harriet didn't like that answer when, when I told her about it last night. Do I have a good place to live? In the general population, around 90 to 95% of people say, yes, I have a good place uh, to live. Uh, in this case, the lowest response was in the Russian mental health population, around 55%. Finns were around uh, 75%, uh, which was comparable to one Canadian hospital, lower uh, than another. In Hong Kong, about 70% said that they had a good place to live. And the last question was, do staff here support my recovery? 
you don't ask it in the general population because they're not uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, but in this case, Brazil did very well. Around 95% uh, said staff do support their recovery. It was also very high in this Canadian hospital. Finland had the lowest rate uh, for, for this item, uh, even lower than, than the Hong Kong population. So there's about 40 different items here. Um, the good news to keep Harriet calm is when you look at summary scales that, that we created with the summary scales, the Finnish hospitals did better than the Russian hospitals. So you can feel good about that. Uh, not quite as good as, as the Brazilian community mental health agencies, though they, they um, really shone uh, with us. So with that, I'll end and thank you for your, your time and attention.